Hi and welcome to this video which is on p-values and p-values are part of the inferential statistics course. So um, just before revising a topic it, it would be very important that you've already revised z-scores. Um, if you haven't already I've linked the video in the description below and it may also be useful for you to revise hypothesis testing before revising p-values. So the hypothesis the hypothesis testing video has also been linked in the description below. And finally, a video that covers the complete inferential statistics course has been linked below as well. So if you want to revise absolutely everything within the inferential statistics course, um, that is available too. So the final thing we're going to look at with regards to inferential statistics it's the p-values. So p-value itself stands for probability value. So this is the probability of getting results at least as unusual as the observed mean, given that the null hypothesis is true. Okay, now that is great, but can you understand what that means? So we're going to really break down the p-value so that you understand it and you can make a much better attempt at approaching these questions. Because often what I find with p-values, students really struggle and tend to learn things off. And once you start learning things off, um, it doesn't make any sense. You just get absolute rubbish in these questions. But basically, in simple terms, the p-value will give us a percentage which we can compare to our standard normal distribution. So let's take a look at our standard normal here. We have a set of possible results. We have very unlikely observations here on the left and on the right, and the true value of the null hypothesis and most likely observations are there in the middle. So there's a 95% statistical significance threshold. And this is important because this one here, that's basically 1.96. And there's a matching one that is just about here, I think. And it's minus 1.96. And everything within that is good. So I'm going to do this in kind of a green color. So this is good. Everything in there is what we want. And these outside pieces, these tails, these are what we call the rejection region. And this rejection region is what we're going to focus on when we talk about our p-values. Now, we've already talked with regards this shape and 95%. So let me go back to this idea. I have... Oh, change color 95% of my data here which means there's 5% in the tails which means down here is 2.5% and here is 2.5% but we're going to work with our tails together so with our p-values we want to compare our answer to the standard normal distribution which is here on our left since we're dealing with 95% confidence or 5% level of significance, we want to ensure that our answer sits inside the middle 95% of our data. So basically those Z scores, those minus 1.96 and 1.96, we want it to sit between those and that's where we're 95% confident. They sit outside those. That's getting into our 5% level of significance. That's where we're kind of worried we're wrong because it's in those tails. It's in those areas where we are we're not sure we really don't think that's going to work they're what we call remember our rejection regions so if the p-value is less than 0.05 or 5 percent it means that it's sitting out in our tail so if it's less than 5 percent we're going to think of it as being out in that rejection region if it's greater than 0.05 that means that it will sit in the main 95% of our graph um, and we fail to reject it. Okay, so if the p-value is bigger than 5%, it's beyond our tails. Because remember, we only have 5% between our tails. So if it's bigger than 5%, it's going into the middle and that is good. So we're going to talk about calculating the p-values and just to say before we start into this that so this is a very mathematical way that we're going to go through it this is really kind of what you would see in the workings however i find that students often struggle with this to understand it so as we're going to go through the example what i'll do is i'll use a very visual um picture like we would do with all of our z-scores to really try and understand what's happening i would definitely be using um a more picture-based or um, a diagram method as you're working through the examples just for yourself to you so you can really get a sense of it I think learning off these kind of formulas not going to be hugely beneficial unless you really understand what's going on 
So um, to calculate p-values, we must first have the z-scores. And I did say earlier that actually we would never use the p-values for hypothesis testing because if I worked and got the z if I wanted to do p-values, I'd first work and get the z-score. So if I got the z-score, would I not just go straight and compare the z-score to minus 1.96 and 1.96? So this is why they asked this question specifically as an extra question, um, a follow-on piece after you've done hypothesis testing. So in order to calculate our z-score, we must first use the one sample z-test on the top of page 35. So we've seen this a few times now. And then we work from our tables and we work out two times one minus the probability the z is less than or equal to the z that we've just worked out. So from page 36 and 37, our log tables, we know that we have the standard normal tables. We're going to use one minus the probability to get the right of our z score, so to get the tail. And we're going to multiply it by two because we want to double it so remember our rejection regions plural they are each of the tails there's 2.5 percent in each tail so to get our five percent we would have to double one of the tails now if that seems like i haven't a clue what's going on that's absolutely fine wait till you see the example and hopefully it will make more sense so i'm going to do um an example that is following on from a hypothesis test. So again, if you're watching the inferential statistics straight, the complete course straight through, you will have already seen part A. If you have, if you're watching just the p-values, you can go back into the hypothesis testing, um, and we did this in the z-score video, that part A. So I'm going to work through the part A because it has some very valuable information. That's why it's here. So the mean lifetime of bulbs has in the past been 1500, that is mu, and a sample of 100, that's n, has recently as recently produced by the company has a mean lifetime of 1475, that's x bar, and 110 is my standard deviation. So test the hypothesis. And actually, this was not true. Spoiler alert. Um, not true. So we um, rejected H0. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because that will actually impact on the next part because the p-value, what we decide with p-value, should also match what we did in our hypothesis test. So if the p-value tells us to reject, we should have rejected above. If it tells us to uh, fail to reject or accept, we should have also done the same above. So it should always match. You're not going to get conflicting answers. So find the p-value of the test you performed in A above and explain what this value represents in the context of the question. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out what is my z-score. So z is equal to x bar minus mu all over sigma over root n. So x bar is given as 1475. Mu is given as 1,500, um, sigma is given as 110, and n is given as 100. So going through my z-score here, 1,475 minus 1,500 all over 110 square root of 100. Working that out, we get minus 2.27. So what we're trying to do is really we're trying to figure out, well, how much lies outside of these tails? So 1, 2, so 2.27. So I'm going to say that that's here. And this is my tail for minus 2.27. But I also want to include the other tail because what I want is a two-tail test and I want both end or both tails to be included because remember our 90 95% sits in the middle so here's what I have and I'm trying to figure out well how much or what percentage of the data lies in each of the tail so I'm not going to bother with the negative because I can't work with the negative so instead I'll work with the positive here now if I asked you can I work with this piece here Hopefully your answer is no. Um, if you go to the top of page 36, you'll see that we can only work with the z-score when we're working to the left. But we do know that the total area under the curve is 1. So this part here actually gives me 1 minus the probability that z is less than or equal to 2.27. Now, when I work that, 
and I'm going to do a little bit of that here. So 1 minus the probability that z is less than or equal to 2.27. Um, what I will do with my answer is I'm going to double it because remember I have two tails. So I'll get my answer for up here, but I also want my answer. So let me get the highlight so you can see it clear. So I'll get my answer for up here, but I also want my answer for down here. So go into my tables and looking up 2.27, what I get is 2 times 1 minus 0 0.9884, which cleaning up gives me 0 0.0116, which gives me 0 0.0. 232, which is 2.32%. So uh, there is 2.32% of the data on those edges. Now, go back to 95% confidence, 5% level of significance. We can only accept this if it's bigger than 5%. Once it's smaller than 5%, it's too far out in the tails. Think about where our 1.96 is. So there is our minus 1.96, there is our plus 1.96. Everything this side and here, they are my rejection regions. So that's my rejection region. And there is my rejection region. So it's too far out. It's not in, it's not in that center 95%. So this is my 95% where I'm so happy, I know everything is good. But those two little tails sit outside in my rejection region. So since 2.32% uh, is less than 5%, we reject the null hypothesis, H0. And that's thinking back to the previous part. And go back. We already have said that the rejection re or sorry, we've already said that we rejected the null hypothesis in part A. So that one matches. So that's really important. Um I suppose just the last part of this is explain what this value means in the context of the question. So a nice quick way to answer that would be to say that the probability of accepting the null hypothesis is 2.32%. Since that's less than the 5% chance that we're wrong, so keeping that in really casual terms, but I suppose just for you to understand it, because that 2.32% is much smaller than the 5% chance I'm wrong, that's not good. So if that was bigger than 5%, that would be okay. So. How, explain what this value represents in the context of the question. So the chance of accepting the null hypothesis is 2.32%. And that is sufficient, all the work you've done, everything you've shown, and that will get you um, your answer.